Hey YouTube, Ethan here. Today we're going to discuss the long-awaited topic of water sustainability and oxygen not included. Water sustainability is a huge priority for those that are trying to get from early game to mid game and especially if you're trying to go from mid game to late game because as you scale up your base, as you take on more duplicates, as you increase your food production, your need for water is going to grow exponentially. And what's worse is that you always seem to run out of water when you least expect it or when you're busy expanding your base and you don't pay attention to it for a couple dozen cycles and then all of a sudden you're out of water. In this video, we're going to take a look at some easy steps that beginners can employ in order to sustain their base throughout the early game, mid game and late game. Every bit of infrastructure that I'm going to show you here is very beginner friendly. Your only limits will be your research, your access to materials, and how fast you can dig out portions of your base in order to create the necessary space to build the infrastructure. Every bit of infrastructure that you see in this video can be scaled up to support massive colonies. It really comes down to space being the limiting factor of how big you build and keeping an eye on your water management as a whole to make sure that you're not running out and the main tanks that feed your base. We're going to pull water from all different sources and this is especially important as well because if you rely on just a single water geyser those things go dormant every once in a while and you can't sustain your base by relying on one or two geysers alone. That may not get you very far if you're starting to run spawns, bristle blossoms and if you aren't recycling water from your washrooms. In my opinion it's always better to have an excessive amounts of water and shut down the production of your water geysers by having them overflow than to not have enough in the first place. So I hope you stick around to the end and let me know if you learned anything in the video. Also let me know if you have any suggestions for other new players that may be looking for this type of information. Please leave them in the comments below so we can all help each other out. A quick note just before we get started, I am on my sandbox asteroid and I've spent a lot of hours preparing this asteroid for different demonstrations and different tutorials. This basically just makes it easier for me to build certain concepts and tutorials that I want to talk about. But everything that you see here will work just fine in the main game without sandbox mode on. So with that, let's get into the video. This block is the heart of any long-term colony. There are multiple different rooms and they all serve a different purpose by collecting, filtering, and eventually cooling your water that you're going to use within your base. The game likes to throw a lot of curveballs at you. For example, if you find a typical water geyser or a cool steam vent, these are not going to be ready to use immediately upon uncovering them. You're going to need to apply resources, power, and materials in order to use the resources that are ejected from these vents and geysers. In the case of a water geyser, the water that accumulates is at 93 degrees Celsius. This is way too hot to use almost anywhere within your base and realistically the only thing that you can do with this is feed it into a spawn or some other electrolyzer system that you may have for your colony. The cool steam vent actually ejects steam so it doesn't even come out as water. You have to cool it, condense it into water and then you're able to use it. Now steam doesn't carry as much heat as water does so it actually condenses and cools a lot quicker. The water that has accumulated from my cool steam vent is sitting at 70 degrees even though the steam ejects at a higher temperature than the water from the water geyser does. So they both have the same problem of being too hot. Then you'll have things like the cool slush geyser. If you find one of these on your asteroid you basically hit the jackpot because this thing is incredibly useful. It's going to eject polluted water at minus 10 degrees celsius and the polluted water does not contain any germs. This can be used immediately to cool your base if your base is running very hot and you don't have a dedicated cooling system already in place. Now in this tutorial I have the polluted water from the cool slush geyser going directly into a water sieve and then from the water sieve it goes into the chamber with my hot water geyser. However, if you had a very hot base, you could snake it all throughout the hot areas and keep your base and colony cool. In this case, it's not so much of a priority because I'm cooling my base with cold oxygen that is coming from my spawn. And then of course we have the ice biome. When all else fails, you can always collect ice, melt it, and then use it within your base. You can also deposit ice in large bodies of water, such as water that comes out from the water geyser, and help cool it down in the process. All these different geysers, vents, and biomes within your asteroid can work in conjunction with one another in order to provide you with clean, fresh, and acceptable temperature range water for your colony. So let's take a look at how the systems on this asteroid are working together. I've already talked about the cool slush geyser. The water from the cool slush geyser after going through my water sieve goes into my water geyser chamber. I've used sandbox mode in order to fill this chamber so my liquid pump works because I have it connected to a hydro sensor. The hydro sensor is not necessarily needed but it allows you to control whether or not you're taking liquid from specific chambers because you may not want to delete all of your liquid. Sometimes it helps to have a backup in each of your reservoirs just in case you have shortfalls in other areas of your base. You can always turn this liquid pump on to work non-stop if needed but if you have it running in a controlled manner you can allow yourself to keep a buffer of water just in case you need it for future mishaps that may happen. 
So we can see the polluted water is going through the water sieve and it is being dumped directly onto the water geyser. Now over time the water here will get a lot colder than the 90 degrees that is being ejected from the water geyser. We may start to see this balance shift once the hot water geyser goes offline. Right now the next dormancy period is 52 cycles whereas the cool slush geyser is already dormant and it will overall help keep this water a lot colder. It's only been a couple seconds and you can already see the effect that it's having. It's now at 87 degrees versus 90 degrees. Now on this asteroid I was lucky enough to have two water geysers and they're relatively close to my main base and the water geyser that is on the top of my base is sending its hot liquid into the chamber with the cool steam vent. Because this water is already hot to begin with that's going to be coming out of the cool steam vent I don't mind mixing the two and two together and this brings me to a really easy way to tame a cool steam vent. Aside from the water coming from the water geyser I also have an automatic dispenser that dispenses ice right above the cool steam vent, which helps cool the surrounding area. So when the steam ejects, it will condense into water much faster and be available to use much quicker. One thing that you have to make sure if you use this strategy is that your ice that is being dispensed by the automatic dispenser cannot be picked back up by your duplicates. If this ice was deposited just one tile higher, the duplicates could stand here, pick up the ice, throw back in the automatic dispenser, which would then drop the ice back down, which would then be picked up by the duplicates again, put into the automatic dispenser, and so on. And then I have a third method of cooling the steam that comes out of the cool steam vent. I'm using a simple aqua tuner and steam turbine cooling loop in order to send very cold water into this chamber. And once this cool steam vent is no longer dormant, the steam that comes out of here will interact with the radiant liquid pipes, which will again help condense the steam into water and make it available for use a lot quicker. One really important thing to keep in mind is that you definitely don't want this cool steam vent to have any germs in this chamber. So be very careful when you breach it and make sure that you have a liquid lock in place before you breach the main chamber. If your base is like mine and you have germs existing in the polluted oxygen that is surrounding your base, it is very easy for them to get mixed into the steam that is coming out of the cool steam vent and then end up in your water when the steam condenses. So the simplest solution to the problem is to not have germs in your water to begin with. So therefore, make sure you build yourself a liquid lock before you breach the area and make sure that you use a liquid lock that is not going to break. I cover liquid locks in another video. If you use vertical liquid locks like these, they can very easily break if you use the wrong type of liquid or if a little bit of water from the steam condenses and makes its way onto the platform where the vertical liquid lock is. So I prefer using the pit method. Another water source that I'm using is from the natural gas generator. Natural gas generators will generally be your first or second types of power generation beyond coal generators and they will produce polluted water for you. They definitely don't produce a lot of polluted water but every little bit helps and especially if your base is struggling with water production you gotta take every little bit that you can get. The natural gas generator produces 67.5 grams per second of polluted water however if you have a petroleum generator in your base it will produce 750 grams per second of polluted water. This is by no means a trivial amount. You're going to have so much polluted water that you may not even be able to use it fast enough. So petroleum generators are an excellent source of water especially if you have an excessive amounts of oil and you're running low on water production. Of course, you can always take polluted water from around the map. Usually it makes more sense to dig out certain parts and let all the polluted water accumulate into one large bay, where then you can put a liquid pump at the very bottom and take the polluted water, filter it, and then use it somewhere else in your base. So if you need the water bad enough, simply put a liquid pump at the bottom and filter it. In this scenario, I have this liquid pump connected into an area that is collecting polluted water, which we'll talk about later. Finally, the last place that you'll find polluted water is from the carbon skimmer. The carbon skimmer is not necessarily an excellent source of polluted water, but it's worth capturing nonetheless. If you're producing some sort of resource, it's always worth capturing to use somewhere else. So now that we covered most of the sources where I'm getting my water from, let's take a look at how I'm processing everything. This is where this chamber comes into play. And I just want to reiterate from the beginning of this video that this is a very small processing chamber that I'm using. You can certainly scale this up and make the rooms as big as you want. For the purposes of this tutorial, I kept everything small so it's easy to follow and easy to see. So let's start from the very top. I have two bottle drainers and they're both asking for different types of liquid. The first bottle drainer is asking for polluted water. The second bottle drainer is asking for salt water. This allows duplicants to dump any polluted water or salt water that they find in bottles around the map into these two chambers. Now obviously you're not going to get a lot of water from dumping bottles of water alone, but if you mop up polluted water or get salt water from the printing pod, these will definitely be worth it so your duplicants have somewhere to store those resources instead of just leaving them out in the open. We've also covered where I'm getting my polluted water from to go into this chamber. One of them could be polluted water that is around the map that I'm not using right now. 
and the other could be a carbon skimmer. Now just for the carbon skimmer and bottle drainer alone, you don't need a very big pit. In the case of salt water, you might be able to find salt water geysers around the map, which you can then tame, take the water from it, and throw it into this pit. Temperature doesn't really matter. The third source of my polluted water is the natural gas generators, which we've already talked about. However, if you're using petroleum generators, this chamber will definitely have to be a lot bigger. You may want to create a separate facility just to treat the water that is coming out of the petroleum generators. That will depend on the scaling of your power generation. When the hydro sensors reach a certain limit, in this case I have them sending a green signal when it's above 1 kilogram, the liquid pumps will turn on, it will send the polluted water or the salt water into their respective filtration buildings. Don't forget to leave access for your duplicates so they can provide the filtration mediums in order to use these buildings effectively. I'll go ahead and brush a little bit of liquid in each chamber just so we can see this in action. Both the salt water and the polluted water will head through their respective buildings and get deposited it into a clean water reservoir. Now arguably you could have this as one complete chamber instead of separating it like this. The swell could be gone and it would function more or less the same. It's really up to you. Before we get down to the last chamber, there's one more thing that we have to cover, and that is this conveyor loader in the very first chamber. This conveyor loader is set to allow only ice, and be sure to check the allow manual use option so your duplicates can directly store ice into this conveyor loader. From here, the ice takes a little trip along the conveyor rail directly into my pool of very hot water from my hot water geyser. Couple this with the cold water that is coming from my cool slush geyser down at the bottom of my map. This water will become cold a lot quicker than if you're not treating it with ice or the near icy water that is coming from the cool slush geyser. So since the video started, this water went from 90 degrees Celsius to 76 degrees Celsius, and it will only continue to get colder as the game progresses. So I hope this is a good demonstration to how you can use multiple different water sources and even sources like ice in conjunction with one another to lower the temperature of your water without applying any sort of power into it as of yet. However, it's worth noting that as the ice is traveling along the conveyor rail, it has the potential to melt if the ambient temperature is too hot. In this case, I'm sending it along the ceramic tile, which is going to keep its temperature fairly well, but as it passes this little gap, you can see the temperature skyrocket to 38 degrees, and it will likely get a lot warmer as the game progresses. So be sure you keep this in mind. You can put your conveyor loader anywhere you want. It doesn't necessarily have to be in this building. So you could put it on top of this chamber or you can put it all the way in your ice biome. Depending on how your map is set up, be creative and put it in an area where the ice is not going to melt. You may also wonder why I'm using a conveyor loader instead of using the automatic dispenser like I'm using for my cool steam vent chamber. And there's two reasons for this. The first is I don't want to expose this area with my water geyser into the atmosphere because the temperature here is very hot at around 80 degrees. And even though I'm using a salt water method here to separate the outside atmosphere to the chamber atmosphere, eventually the salt water will warm up and it will distribute that heat into the rest of my asteroid. However, the heating that I'm going to get from the cool steam vent is a lot less because the density of the steam is a lot lower than water. So this chamber with the water geyser will be immensely hotter than the cool steam vent chamber, which is why I don't have it exposed to the atmosphere and which is why I'm not using a liquid lock because it would transfer heat into the outside atmosphere. The only downside to this is that the automatic dispenser takes 60 watts of power and the conveyor loader will take 120. So if you can afford the power, I would definitely go with the conveyor loader because it makes heat management a lot easier. You could certainly vacuum seal the liquid lock as the example is here and a vacuum sealed liquid lock will separate the two atmospheres and keep the temperatures different on both sides of the liquid lock chamber. But in this case, I decided to go with the conveyor chute and the conveyor loader just to show that it does work. And we can put a little bit of ice up here and show that in action. So our duplicates will come and load the ice into the conveyor loader. And as you can see, inside the ceramic tile, there's not much temperature change. It's around 35 to 40 degrees below zero. But as soon as it gets exposed to the atmosphere, it skyrockets to about 30 degrees Celsius below zero. If this conveyor rail had a long enough exposure to the outside atmosphere, the ice would eventually melt and it would create a big puddle and not make it into your water geyser chamber. And of course, like I said before, this will also help cool your water chamber. So now that we've covered all of our water sources and filtration, now we have to cover water cooling. This can look intimidating at first, but it's actually very easy. The clean water chambers pump the water into a liquid vent into my final chamber, which is the cooling chamber. Water from my water geyser is being pumped into my 
spawn electrolyzer setup, but it is also being diverted into my cooling chamber as well. And finally, the water that is coming from the top water geyser that gets pumped into the cool steam vent chamber also gets pumped into the cooling chamber. Here I'm using another hydro sensor in order to shut these vents off when the chamber gets too full. In my case, one hydro sensor controls all three at the same time. This arguably is redundant because these would overpressure anyways, but it gives me some sense of control in case I need to shut these vents off. And you can also get creative and control each individual liquid vent if the liquid vents have different water temperatures coming into the cooling chamber because this might make it easier for you to cool down the water. For example, if your asteroid has only hot water vents and no sources of cool water, you may want to limit how much hot water you put into this chamber because the overwhelming amounts of hot water may make it more difficult to cool. This is going to be dependent on the asteroid that you're on. So get creative and save yourself the trouble by putting these in early. The actual cooling process is happening from another aqua tuner that is combined with a steam turbine. I'm using polluted water as my cooling substance and this flows through radiant liquid pipes inside the cooling chamber. I'm using a thermo sensor connected to a NOT gate and a buffer gate. The setting on my thermo sensor is set to send a green signal if the ambient temperature is below 22 degrees. Set the number that you would like to use to feed to your bristle blossoms and in other parts of your base. When this sends the green signal, it allows this liquid pump to work because it's detecting that the temperature around the lick pump is the preferred temperature I'd like to use. Then it sends another green signal into a NOT gate, which then goes into a buffer gate. You can see this action right now. This means that when the temperature rises too high, the NOT gate will transform the input into a green signal and the buffer gate acts as a way to flush the liquid out of my radiant liquid pipes back into my aqua tuner to be cooled. I have this set at an arbitrary 20 seconds. I feel like this gives me enough time to flush this entire piping system for new water. And these two automation buildings are connected to a liquid shutoff. And this is what's controlled the flow. Currently, the water enters via the radiant liquid pipes at around 10 degrees, and it will absorb the heat from the pool of water, thus cooling it in the process. Then, when the thermo sensor detects that the pool is no longer cooling below the set limit, it flushes the system for more cold water from the aqua tuner and sends the hot water back to be cooled farther. The main benefit to this is that the aqua tuner uses a lot of power. It uses 1.2 kilowatts, so I don't want this running at all times. I could just use the liquid pipe thermal sensor to send a green signal to the aqua tuner when the temperature is above 15 degrees Celsius, and this would effectively do the same thing at keeping this chamber cool. So once again, here is the setup. Cold water comes from the aqua tuner, enters the chamber, and it sits here until it has absorbed enough heat from the chamber. Because my buffer gate is set to 20 seconds, it will filter out this entire piping system where cold water can then come in and absorb more heat. And finally, the very last step, after I've treated my polluted water, treated my salt water, and cooled down the water that is coming from my water geysers, is to send it into my base. It is sent into my base using insulated liquid pipe, which keeps the temperature relatively equal as it makes its way into the very last chamber where it can then be used by my bristle blossoms and whatever else that you may need, such as a carbon skimmer. This extra chamber is totally optional. You don't have to use it. But like I said in the beginning, it's always good to have buffers set up throughout the system in case something fails, because if if you have a failure point within your infrastructure system, it's going to take some time to get it back online. So this is why multiple geysers, multiple chambers, and multiple reservoirs of water are going to be very helpful in keeping your base sustained throughout the whole game. Finally, before we end this video, there's one more tip that I have to show you. And this is one that is very easy to set up and very common to use. And you can set it up pretty much at the start of your game. And this is a bathroom looping system. This bathroom has been running for dozens of cycles and it has never run out of water. After priming the system, I disconnected the water source and all the water that is coming out from my sinks, lavatories and showers goes directly into a water sieve. Once it is filtered, it then comes back out and it can be reused by the sinks, lavatories and showers again. Now there is a caveat to this and that is that you'll produce more polluted water than your duplicates use. So you need a runoff for the extra polluted water, otherwise your system will get backed up and your duplicates won't be able to use the toilets. The liquid pipe that is connected to the inlet will always prefer to go into the building that the inlet is connected to. However, any excess in water will divert into the liquid pipe that is connected to it. And because reed fibers are so important for your colony for the production of Atmos suits, it makes sense to feed this into hydroponic farms. So there you have it. This is Water Sustainability 101 in Oxygen Not Included. To recap, find all the sources of your water, such as ice, polluted water on the map, buildings such as natural gas generators, petroleum generators, carbon skimmers, and take a look at all the geysers within the vicinity of your base that are practical to use, and simply take the water and cool it. How you deal with the filtration is completely up to you, but if you have something compact like this, you can take all those water sources into one area and filter and cool them simultaneously. In my opinion, this is definitely a lot better than having multiple water cooling areas throughout your asteroid.
If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. And please let me know in the comments if you were able to learn anything, if you have any questions, or if you have any suggestions. Also, if you don't mind, please leave a rating on this video as this helps the video reach more people so more people are able to watch and learn from my tutorials. To my regulars on the channel, thank you so much for all your support. And thank you for the suggestion for making this water sustainability video. I look forward to your feedback in the comment below. I hope this video has been helpful. And until next time, I'm Ethan, and I'll talk to you guys later.